All right, so the class is being recorded right now. And we are, we just talked about how to call and how to return using TTP ASMs. So the main idea is we push the return address you know, from the caller's you know, perspective, and then we jump into the subroutine. From the callee's perspective, we pop the return address back into a register, and then we perform a indirect jump, which is the JMPA or JMP whatever register you want to use instruction. So that's what we talked about last time. Um, I'm just kind of, you know, I just want to bring that up a little bit to give you the context of what we'll be talking about today. So the lab today is going to be related only to what we talked about last time, which is on the last Thursday. Um, but what we will be talking about today is how do you communicate between the caller and the callee. Okay, the caller is the one who's making the call, and then the callee is the subroutine that is being called. So that's going to be the focus of today's lecture. Um, I have tried different ways to reorganize, you know, how you know I want to present the material. So the best way to do it is really to talk about, you know, how the caller, the the code that is invoking the subroutine, and the subroutine, you know, what kind of agreement do they have? Um, I also moved the content of the material a little bit, and this is the right class. Ah, oh, darn it. So I did the rearrangement you know, for the wrong class, unfortunately, so you guys cannot see it. <clears throat> it's not that big of a deal. It's just that I have things you know, scattered that really should, all, should belong together. Like this one talks about how do you submit TTP, a, TTP ASM files. And it's specifically useful for people who are using Macs. Because on the Mac, there's apparently there are, there are no plain text editors. So when you copy and paste the code you know, from uh, the <clears throat> TTPSM um, spreadsheet onto a document, you know, it does not do it correctly. So you have to kind of go through some uh, specific process to get it working. Um, and then we also have some modules that talk about how to trace the execution of TTP ASM code, which is going to be quite important from here on because you really want to be able to visualize or at least be able to trace what's happening on the stack, you know, who is accessing what for what purpose. So that's also going to be useful. So right now they're kind of scattered. They're here, but they're kind of scattered, which means you know you kind of have to go through the links and read every single one of these, and you know kind of make your own notes so that you can remember how to get things done. So today's your know, lecture is going to be about your know, caller callee agreement. So there are a few things that we want to talk about in that case. Your know, caller callee agreement. So we'll start with this particular slide. <coughs> So from the caller side, if there are arguments, the arguments are also pushed on the stack, but in reverse order. So that means the last argument is pushed first. Okay. The return address is going to be pushed after all the arguments. Um, so if any, it's applying to the arguments because you can have a subroutine that have no parameters, so the caller would not be pushing anything in that case. And then the caller would also jump to the entry point of the callee, you know, in other words, the subroutine that you're calling. The callee should then return to the instruction. You know, when it's done, it should return to the instruction right after the JMPI instruction, the jump instruction. If the callee returns a scalar value, the scalar value is going to be in register A. The value of registers A, B, and C are not assumed preserved by the subroutine. In other words, if the caller has put something specific into register A, B, or C, it cannot expect the values of those registers to be preserved after the subroutine returns. So every single register can be overwritten by the subroutine. If there are al also, if there are arguments, then the caller has the responsibility to clean up the stack space used by the arguments. All right, so that's from the caller's you know, perspective. From the callee's perspective, at the entry point of the callee, the stack pointer should always point to the return address. If the callee has parameters, then the first parameter starts at the address immediately after um, the address of the return address, and then the last parameter has the highest address of all the parameters. Parameters are contiguous in TTP, which means there's no spacing. You know, we, don't, we don't leave any empty space between the parameters. In the callee's code, additional stack space may be utilized 
there's no need to preserve the values of registers A, B, or C. So the callee, any subroutine can have access to the, the registers A, B, and C. Register D is out of the question because that is our stack pointer. So you cannot touch the stack pointer unless you're using it as a stack pointer. At the exit point of the callee, if the callee has a scalar return value, use register A to restore to store the return value. If the callee is responsible to pop the return address, um, the call, excuse, excuse me, the callee is responsible to pop the return address, and then the callee would use the return uh, popped return address to return to the caller. So this basically summarizes you know everything that is um, that the caller and the callee need to agree on. So everything is on the stack. So there, other than how we use the stack, the caller and the callee have no further agreements. So they can basically make no assumptions whatsoever about each other. So let me just pause here and see if there are questions about the terms used in this description. So I'm not even talking about you know, the actual meaning of the slide here. I'm talking about the terms that is introduced in this particular slide. Do we have any questions about, for instance, the differentiation between arguments and parameters? Uh, what is a caller? What is a callee? What is a return address? That sort of thing. So I'm just going to, yep, go ahead. Say again? Scalar. Oh, a scalar is anything that is like a pointer, a, an int, a float, a, you know, a char. Those are basically called, they're, they're called scalar type. They're basically um, a type where it does not have uh, components. So an array is not a scalar. Uh, structure is not a scalar, but a pointer is a scalar because it is one single thing. And you know, in C plus plus or C programming, you cannot break it up into smaller components. Okay, so that's a good question. You know, what a scalar type is. All right, any other questions? Because you know, this is a rather important discussion. So I just want to make sure that all the terms are understood first, and then we'll talk about you know how these terms you know kind of combine into more important concepts that we are going to talk about in today's class. No questions? So we're good? Okay, all right. So what I'll do is I am going to first introduce the concept of arguments. And the way I usually do things at this point of the semester is I'm just going to write some sample programs. Um, and I typically do these things you know, on the fly, which means you know, none of these is pre-planned. Um, just you know, depending on you know how I am teaching the concept you know, in that particular class, so things can be introduced in a slightly different way. <clears throat> so I'm just going to write. Um, <clears throat> so I'll use dash. I think it's uppercase O. Okay, I will see. Because I want to write you know, both the assembly code and the C code at the same time. On the left hand side we have the C code. On the right hand side we have the assembly code. So I'm just going to focus on the C code first. So in the C code, I would have a uh, function, and it doesn't do anything particularly useful. Uh, the first thing I usually do is I would include standard integer dot h, because this gives me the ability to use uin8 underscore t to refer to an unsigned a bit integer, which is basically a byte. Okay, because this way I can have full equivalency between the C code and the assembly code, because the the assembly code TTP ASM or the TTP is an 8-bit processor, so the return you know, type is typically just an 8-bit thing. You know, we do not return anything that's you know, wider than 8-bit. So I just go like, um, <clears throat> okay, I call this myself, okay, and you know the only thing it does, okay, is to return the parameter itself, which is that. All right. <clears throat> so this is what we want to do with you know, myself as a function. And then we have main. And in main here, the only thing we're going to do is to call the subroutine with a particular value, let's say 45, and then return 0. So obviously this program, if you run it in C, it doesn't do a single thing, right? You know, because it just calls the subroutine. The subroutine returns the same value as the parameter but then we do nothing about it. In other words, line 10 is gonna call the subroutine. The subroutine actually has a return value, 
I just toss the return value away, which is perfectly okay in C++ or C. In some other programming languages, if you're calling a function that returns a value, it will make sure that you make use of the return value. C does not care, okay? So we look at this program, okay? You go like, okay, so um, it's kind of pointless. So how do we even know this program in C is doing what it is supposed to? So what we'll do is we're gonna compile the program, okay? Uh, this is called ARG, ARG.C, <coughs> GDB, ARG. Look at the program, and I'm gonna put a breakpoint on line 11. So, and then I'll just run the program until it gets to line 11. So you would say, but there's, there are no side effects whatsoever in this program. We are not even storing the return value to a local variable of any kind. That's, that's because I don't want to complicate the discussion here with, oh, this is how we deal with local variables. We'll deal with that later, okay? But right now, we're just going like, how do we know the return value of 45 is actually returned, okay? Because there's nothing storing it. As it turns out, you know, GCC, which is the you know, GNU C compiler, which many of you are actually using, you know, in your other classes, because code blocks typically would use your know, GCC or G++, um, many of your other classes using Visual Studio or VS Code would also use you know, a backend of GCC or G++. So the convention of G++ on a 64-bit or 32-bit architecture is to store the return value into the A register in the architecture. So the A register can be called many names. It can be called register A in an A-bit you know, version of the x86 architecture. It is called AX, which is a 16-bit 16 16-bit 16 uh, register in the 16-bit version of the x86 you know, architecture. It is also called EAX in a 32-bit version of the x86 architecture, otherwise known as the 386 architecture. And in the 64-bit architecture, I believe it is called H-A-X, okay, which I'm not 100% sure, but we'll find out. So we'll see whether E-H-A-X is a register. Nope, uh, E-A-X, nope, there you go. So it's actually, E-A-X is a subpart of the 64-bit architecture. So we can see that the return value is actually stored in quote-unquote register A, even in GCC. So let me just pause here and see if everybody understood you know, what the point of this experiment is and how it is illustrating that the convention that we are talking about is not something that I invented. This is actually a convention used by commercial um, and open source um, compilers. So are we doing okay so far with this? EAX is what is equivalent to register A in the case of an AD, uh, uh, in the case of an x86 architecture, which is what the PC uses. So I'll be sufficiently convinced that we utilize a register, usually register A, to specify the return value. Okay. Are there any questions? No questions. Okay. So if, if this is a little bit cloudy, hopefully the assembly code would help illustrate this in TTPASM, <clears throat> and it will be more clear about you know, how things are done. So now I move on to the assembly code. Um, I have to start with a no-op instruction because I do intend to run this on the command line so that I can actually just capture the trace you know, of the entire thing. I'm gonna branch around the definition of myself so I, have, I need a JMPI to main, and then before that, I will just kind of make this, um, I will initialize the stack pointer to location zero. So all of this stuff is already discussed last Thursday. So if you're asking, okay, what are these? You know, what are we using register D for? You know, those are a part of the discussion on last Thursday, the previous class. So over here, I have the subroutine myself, which I'm gonna you know, do later on. But I'll, I'll go ahead and write main first. So we can see that the first thing main needs to do is to call myself, which is the uh, name of the function. So from last class, we know that we have to you know, define the uh, continuation point. So we'll say continue from calling myself, which is the name of the function. 
So this label is marking the continuation point. And then according to what we saw earlier, the caller is responsible to push the parameters. So in this case, uh, 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 okay, excuse my language, it is supposed to push the arguments. So in this case, we have a single argument of 45, so the caller has to push 45 on the stack. So do you guys remember how to push something on the stack? What is the first thing we need to do? This was something that we talked about last Thursday, okay? So at this point of this class, it is super important, okay? I cannot overemphasize that it is really important to make sure that you clear the concept of all the previous classes before the starting point of a new class because everything is, has a dependency now. Okay, so I, I can remind you guys what we are supposed to do. The first thing is we need to decrement the stack corner, which is basically decrement D because we designate register D as our stack corner. And then the second thing we have to do is to um, overwrite whatever the stack point is pointing to in RAM with the value that we are specifying we are pushing. So this is what we want to do, but we cannot, okay, so let me re-emphasize, we cannot do this. This is not going to work because you know, um, the second <coughs> operand cannot be a 45, it has to be a register. So that means, you know, okay, so we cannot do it in one single instruction, but we can do something like this. Put 45 into a register that is free at this point, that is not being in use, say let register A, and then we just have to store register A to whatever the you know, register D is pointing to. So this is how we push 45 on the stack, which in this particular document, is you know, we are basically doing this part here. If there are arguments, arguments are pushed in reverse order. But since there's only one argument, there's no such thing as quote unquote reverse versus not reversed, because if there's only one argument, you just push it. So you don't have to worry about, um, which one should I push first? Well, since there's only one, you just push it. So the next thing we have to push is the return address. Okay, so we are now onto the second main bullet point here. So in here, okay, this part should be easy because this is what we did in on last Thursday. So we do about the same thing, okay? Continue you from calling myself and then your know, STDA again. So now we push the return address. So I'm gonna comment here a little bit here. So whatever, so we have SP minus minus <clears throat> and then we have whatever SP is pointing to is now going to be continue from calling myself, which is the return address. So getting back here, the next thing we need to do is to jump to the entry point of the callee. So the callee has an entry point of the label myself. So that means over here, we do a JMPI to myself. So as far as the caller is concerned, we are now at this point. Um, the callee should return to the instruction right after the jump instruction. Okay, that's good. Um, if the callee returns a scalar value, it would be in register A. Okay, it's good to take note of that, but there's nothing I can really do to demonstrate it until we trace the code of, the, trace the running of this code. Then the next thing is um, the, reg the value of registers A, B, and C are not assumed preserved. Okay, once again, you know, we, there's nothing to demonstrate here because we are just saying, okay, do not make any assumptions. If there are arguments, the caller has the responsibility to, to clean up the stack space used by arguments, if any. So that means now would be a good time to clean up after the arguments, okay? So we'll just say that argument 45 is still on the stack. Time to clean it up. So the only way, you know, the only thing we have to do to clean it up is to increment the stack pointer. Because you know, we don't, we're not popping it because we don't care about that value. It's a value that I pushed you know, on the stack earlier. So of course I know what it is. I just don't need it to be on the stack anymore. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay, so this entire discussion up to this point is basically looking at the caller callee agreement and putting those things into code inside a TTP ASM program. So it being able to map between these two is going to be very important. This is an illustration of you know, the actual text here that describes you know, the, the agreement between the caller and the callee. 
All right, so from the caller's perspective, we are now completely done with line 10. It's time to get on to line 11, return zero. That's an easy one. All you have to do is to say halt because you know, there's nothing to return to when you are writing code in TTP ASM because there's, there are no operating system to say, oh, okay, when this is all done, you'll come back to me and I'll give you the command prompt again you know, to enter further command. Nope, there's nothing like that. We just simply have to say halt. There's nothing else to do. So the program is now done from the perspective of the caller. And it's time to move on to the perspective of the callee or the function that is being called. <clears throat> so the function is called myself. It's named for myself here because um, that is what it does, okay? It, it basically just returns the value of the only parameter that it has. It just uses that as a return value. So the only exercise here is how do we get to the parameter? So what we want to do is to take a look at the stack at the entry point of myself. So the first thing we see on the stack or the higher location of the stack would be the parameter X. Then the lower location is going to be the return address. This has to do with the agreement between the caller and the callee because the caller and the callee both agreed that the caller would push the argument first, then it would push the return address. So that means the argument is going to be at a higher location the return address is going to be at a lower location. The ordering of pushing versus the addresses of the content being pushed on the stack, the way they, re they relate, that's also something that we talked about on Thursday. Okay, so this is why it is really important to clear all the concepts and be able to understand all the concepts from a previous class because I have no choice but to make references to those concepts you know, because otherwise, you know, um, the class is not going to go anywhere. I, I would not be able to finish all the material that I need to introduce in this class. <clears throat> but because the return address is the last thing that we push on the stack, the stack pointer would be pointing to the return address at this point, at the entry point of the subroutine. All right, so I'm going to pause, okay, because I do want to make sure that if there are any questions about what I have done so far, that I would, you know, that I can answer those questions first before I move on any further. Are there any questions? And I can also kind of correspond to our discussion at this point. Lines six, seven, which are basically just comments, is corresponding to 1.2, and it is corresponding to this part here. So at the entry point of the callee, which means you know, right at the label of the callee, the stack pointer points to the return address. Okay, yep, that's what we are assuming. The first parameter starts at the address immediately after or higher than that of the return address. Yep, so this is X. X has a higher address than re the return address. So that's basically what this is referring to, is we are really just looking at the first main bullet point of <clears throat> the callee side agreement. Are we okay so far? Okay, all right. So I need to return the value of x, so I need to somehow get to the address of x, right? So if I could do something like this, okay, you know, d plus one, that would be great, but I cannot because you know, whatever is in the second operand of LD has to be a register. So I cannot do something like this. So that means what I need to do is to say, okay, fine, let's use another register. This is the first time we use CPR. So CPR, okay, what does CPR stand for and what does it do? Copy register. So what does copy register do? So copy register is the name or you know, that is after the, the mnemonic is, is after the name, but what does it do? Which way does it copy? Does it copy register D to register C, or does it copy register C to register D? D to C, very good. So all the mnemonics of the TTP ASM follow one single convention. If a register is going to be modified, it is always the first operand of the mnemonic. So it doesn't matter whether you're adding, subtracting, oring, anding, <laughs> Com uh, compare doesn't count because it doesn't store anything. 
uh, LD, ST, and so on, we always update the first operand, which is basically the same syntax or the same ordering in an assignment operation in C or C++. Okay, so that makes it a little bit easier to remember is we just follow the same convention as in C or C++. The left-hand side, or in this case, the first operand is the one that is being updated. Okay, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm common this, okay? C equals D, that's all it's gonna say. So, but with this, okay, so let's see what is on the stack right now after this instruction. So that means, you know, D is pointing to this location. So we see, because C is now a duplicate, you know, uh, pointer to point to exactly the same location. <clears throat> I cannot change D around, okay? That's one of the rules about the, the stack pointer is you do not want to increment because anything that is below where the stack pointer points to can potentially be clobbered by what I would just say gremlins. Yes, I said the word gremlins, okay? The mythical creatures from the movie Gremlins. So anything that is below where the stack pointer points to can mysteriously be modified, overwritten, you know, by gremlins, okay? I cannot quite explain you know, what gremlins are at this point because it's not the main idea that I want to express now, but the point is you don't want to increment the stack pointer until you know for sure what the stack pointer is pointing to is no longer of use to you. Do I still need the return address at this point in the subroutine? What is, the, okay, what is the purpose of the return address? What, what do I use it for? Return to the caller. So do I still need the return address at this point of the subroutine, the callee? The answer is yes, okay? So I don't want to change the stack pointer. I don't want to increment the stack pointer because if I did that, the gremlin will come and chew up the return address. So by the time I need to use the return address, it won't be the correct you know, return address anymore. So that's why I have to use register C because register C is not a stack pointer. I can move the, the I, I can move, I can change register C any way I want without the side effects of the gremlins you know, chewing up something that I do not want it to chew up. All right, so what do we do now? We just say increment C, okay? So when we increment C, the, uh, what happens to the picture of the stack? Okay, I need to copy this one too is now, okay, so C is now moved up by one byte, so C is now pointing to X on the stack, which also means at this point, I can do LDAC, so that you know, A is basically the dereferencing of C, which means A is actually getting the value of X, our parameter, and that's the only thing I need to do, right? You know, because according to the C code, the only thing I have to do is to return the value of the only parameter, which is x here. I have just accomplished that because according to the caller callee you know, agreement, uh, register A is what we store, is where we store the return value. So getting back to the document here, uh, it specifies here, if the callee has a return scalar return value, which in this case it is because it's just an integer, use register A to store the return value. All right, we just accomplished that. So now <clears throat> we just have to return. So the returning part is to pop the return address, and then we use the pop popped return address to return to the caller, which is the JMP instruction. So now we just have to um, do the pop operation. So if you cannot remember how we pop a value from a stack, I'm giving you a quick review here, just like I gave you a quick review of all of the other concepts a little bit earlier. So we, um, first we have to copy whatever the stack pointer points to, to one of the registers. I can choose any register except for register A, because register A has a special purpose now. It is the return value. So I cannot use register A, I cannot use register D, because that's the stack pointer. I can choose between register B versus register C, so I'm just gonna go like, yeah, let's pick register B. Because remember, the callee has no obligation to preserve any of the registers. So I can mess up every single one of them. The caller cannot complain. All right, so we'll use register B. So we want register B to be whatever the stack pointer points to. So that's an LD instruction with B and then register D in parentheses. <coughs> and then we have to increment the stack pointer, okay? So SP++, so that's increment register D. 
So now we have popped the return address into register B. Now we just have to do a JMP B to continue execution at the location that register B is pointing to in RAM. All right. So I think the program is done. So we're going to test it. But before I go test the code, do we have any questions? All right. Um, so I'm going to nag one more time. The concept that we talked about on last Thursday is used a lot in today's lecture. The whole concept of the stack pushing, popping, the concept you know, of you know, using a stack pointer to maintain you know, what was the last item being pushed on the stack, the concept of how to translate stack operations into TTP ASM instructions, those are all being used in today's lecture. Okay? Um, the pushing of the return address, the use of the return address, you know, popping and then in direct jump using the return address, that's already introduced here. That's already talked about here. Um, so that means, you know, I'm not sure, you know, how you can do it, but you really have to spend the time to make sure that all the concepts from a previous class is fully understood before the starting of the next class. And that's going to be this way all the way till the end of the semester. There's no resting, you know, stop at this point. It's a straight run all the way to the end. All right. <clears throat> so if you are looking at this code, I hope nobody is you know, you know meeting this you know, description. If somebody is looking at this code here and go like, I have no idea what is going on, it really means you know well. There's a lot of review to do before Thursday. Because on Thursday, we're going to move on and talk about some additional concepts. This is going to be assumed to be understood. I do have office hour you know, on every single day. So in, on Thursday, the office hour is from 8 to 9, which is right before class. So for people who really want you know, some additional help to explain the concepts, the office hour is a good resource. Um, the other resource would be going to the Mesa Center if you're a Mesa you know, uh, member to ask you know, the tutors you know, who has taken this class from me in the previous semester. <clears throat> because uh, you know, not getting the concepts clarified before a class you know, from here on is just going to compound the difficulty of this class to no end. All right, so I've done my preaching you know, enough times. I think that was four times now, right? So I think I can move on to talk about how this program runs and how do we look at the result when the program runs. Okay, so I can do that in a different um, commit line. So we'll go ahead and do this. I'm going to use Reaper Spider, you know, just to so, just so I don't spend too much time to um, do everything manually. So I just go to my documents, CRSP pretend, Reaper Spider. And all I have to do is to submit the source code, which is arg.ttpasm in the temp folder. Oh, okay. It does not exist. Why? Because I didn't save it. <laughs> this, is, this is a typical thing that I do you know, where a GUI type you know, uh, tool, you know, development tool, would be better because you know, see this plus here? That's telling me I changed the file, but I didn't save it. Okay, save it. Oh, okay, save and exit the editor. That's fine. Um, all right, so we now go to this tool and repeat the command. This time it should run. <clears throat> so this tool does everything, quote unquote, automatically. Um, it will submit the source file to the, uh, to the source tab of the assembler, and then it will download the object code, you know, the code that is supposed to be loaded into RAM. It will run Logisim and then collect the trace data. It will upload the tra trace data back onto the assembler tool to the trace raw data tab, and then you know, everything is done automatically. So all I have to do is to go to the assembler and take a look at the analysis tab. It's all here already. So it's a great tool to help save time. It does take a little bit of time to set it up the first time. 
So you know you do have to invest a little bit of time to set it up. But once it is set up, you know it is a great tool because it shows you exactly what happens when every single instruction executes. So it's a great way to kind of document the whole thing, and you know so you can figure out, oh, okay, so when this when this is when this instruction executes, it's doing this and so on. So I'm just going to go through this you know, rather quickly. Okay, the first thing is a no op instruction doesn't do a single thing. The next one is a LDI D zero. We initialize the stack pointer to zero zero. Then the next one is JMPI to main, which means we continue execution at the label main. In which case, the first thing it wants to do is to push 45 on the stack. Decrement the stack pointer, load 45 into register A, and then store the value of register A to wherever the stack pointer is pointing to, which re results in a 2D being stored at the location of FF. When we decrement the stack pointer, it went from 0, 0 to FF. Because when you subtract 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, you get 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and that's FF in hexadecimal. So we store 2D in location FF, and that's because 2D is representing 45. Why? Because 45 is 2 times 16, which is 32, plus 13. The D is the 13, which is 1101 in binary. Are we doing okay so far? So I'm basically mentioning all of those things that you're supposed to understand at this point of this semester. But I do want to mention those because if you're having some holes in your knowledge, then you should probably pay attention to that and make sure that you understand those concepts at this point. <clears throat> and if not, you can always ask me. And then we decrement D, okay, uh, again, because this time we have to push the return address. So register D went from FF to FE, and then we load the uh, label, the value of the label that marks where the subroutine is supposed to return to, which is uh, continue from calling myself, <clears throat> and that is 1.5. And you can double check whether 1.5 is the right value or not. You can go to the assemble tab, and then look at the definition of label return from calling myself, which is this label here. And you can see column W indicates that the next location is indeed location 15 in hexadecimal. So this is how we can cross check to see whether the trace is making sense or not. And it is making sense so far. And then we store that value 15 in hexadecimal to where the stack point is pointing to because we're still in the middle of a push operation. So now, you know, location FE in RAM is storing the value of 1.5. I'm going to pause a little bit here and see if there are any questions. Okay, no questions. All right. So I can even give you a more graphical representation of what, of what is going on, you know, using the tablet. So we can, we can kind of do a little bit of that, you know, in just a little bit. But I still want to kind of, uh, go through the trace, you know, just step by step to show you what is happening as the program executes. And then we have the JMPI instruction, the actual branch instruction to start at the beginning of the uh, function. The first thing in the function that we do is we copy register D, register D to register C, and that's why register C now has a value of FE as well. Okay, the stack pointer and register C are the same at this point. They both point to the return address on the stack, which we put there earlier with this instruction here. <clears throat> and then we increment your know, register C. I can increment, decrement register C all I want. It doesn't change you know, uh, anything on the stack because register C is not the stack pointer. So the stack pointer, or I should say, the register C is now FF, which means it is now pointing to the 45 that we pushed a little bit earlier in, you know, in this code. So register C is pointing to the value that I want to retrieve in RAM. And then we just say, okay, why don't we just retrieve that? That's what the LD instruction is doing. So these two combined is a pop operation. We are, um, nope, I take it back. <clears throat> We're not popping anything. We are just looking into the stack and retrieve a value that is still on it. So now register A has a value of 2D, which is our 45. So we have gotten to our return value already. 
So the rest of the code is really the return code that we have already talked about on last Thursday. We basically pop the return address into register B in this case. We cannot pop it into register A because register A now has, its, has a special purpose. It is specifying the return value, so we cannot overwrite register A at this point, but we can overwrite register B or register C. So in this case, I decide to overwrite register B. And once you know, I have popped the return address into register B, I do a JMPB, which is really just copying register B to the program counter, which means, you know, oh, the next location I'll do a fetch operation is going to be whatever register B has, which is 1.5. So that is why con uh, execution continue at location 1.5, which is the rest of the code of main calling uh, myself. <clears throat> so it has to increment D by one so that the stack pointer is now back to zero, zero, because the argument that is still sitting on the stack is of no use to me anymore. So I have to clean that up. And then after that, I have no use of anything and I get to the halt instruction. And that's the end of the execution of this particular program. But the bottom line is the last update to register A is a 2D, which means the return value of 45 is indeed in register A. So this is how I can verify that the TTP ASM code is doing what it is supposed to because the return value is in uh, register A. All right, so are we doing okay so far with this part of the explanation? Just looking at the trace of the execution of the code. <clears throat> I see that three people are on this one. So one thing you can do, okay, you know, this is something that you probably can do uh, from here on quite a bit, is to go to file, go to make a copy, and just make a copy of this entire thing right now. Because the source tab has the right code, the um, <clears throat> trace raw data tab has the right to raw data for tracing, and then the analysis tab has exactly the right thing that you need in order to kind of go come back to this one and review you know, what is going on when, you know, with this program. So this would be a good time to take a snapshot. <laughs> I can see a lot of people are doing that. Very good. So take a snapshot, you'll go to file. I'll say that one more time. Go to file, go to make a copy, and you know, then you have a copy of this entire thing. I can mess around with my own assembler any way I want, but your copy will stay the same. Yes? Say again? Um, no, this is not the same program. So. So once, uh, because you know, the school does not charge you any money for using Google Drive as long as you're a student here. So what you can do is every time I wrote, every time I write a specific program to illustrate the concept, you make a copy, name your copy appropriately so that you know what it is about. Then you have that you know, in your record. You can print it out if you want to, bring it to the final exam if that is, that's what you want. You can study it. You can kind of go through the whole process again, try to explain it yourself. It's up to you. But this is a resource. I'm just going to say this is a resource. It is particularly useful if you can jot down you know, somewhere um, about the date when we talk about this and also the approximate time that we talk about this. So this way you can go back to the video and just revisit the entire discussion in class. All right, so the next thing I'm going to do is to look at things from the perspective of you know, what's happening on the stack, <clears throat> which is basically just retracing all of these steps, but with a focus on what is happening to register D and also what is happening on the stack. Okay, what am, what am I writing on the stack and what am I writing on the stack? So to do that, I'm going to use my tablet on the side. So this is more of a you know, kind of graphical representation, but there's only so much I can do with a graphical representation because you know, unless you know how to animate, you know, um, between the slides, it's hard to look at a static picture and see the dynamic operation that I have been doing on the stack. <clears throat> I still think this, what we're looking at here, the trace, is the best way to understand, you know, what is going on on the stack. Um, you just really have to know how to read it, but I you know, kind of explained that too. <clears throat> All right, 
So I'm starting up my tablet right now. It's just taking its time to start up. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to start with a new prompt here, and we'll just do it SCT, S, STR screen, SCT, CPY copy dot message. There we go. Probably cannot find it yet. Okay, that's fine. All right. So let me go to the folder for this class. Or the new notepad. There we go. Now we can find it, and it always pops up on the other side, which is okay. I'm going to move it over to where you can see it. So I'll put it all the way over here, so this way I still have visibility of <coughs> the browser. There we go. All right. So we are now focusing on what is happening on the stack. <clears throat> and I'll make specific locations too, in this case. This is location FF, this is location FE, and I really just need to have you know, these two locations on the stack. So when we call the subroutine, the value of 45 is pushed first. So that means you know, the 2D, which is you know, the hexadecimal representation of 45, is put into this location first. That's what we push first. And then the return address, which is the 1.5, is pushed second. So that's why you know, it is at the location of FE. So at the entry point of the function that we're calling, which is called myself, the stack pointer is pointing to this location. We make a copy of the stack pointer to register C. So register C starts off pointing to exactly the same location, but then we increment C after that. So that means you know, C is now updated to point to this location. That is when we use an LD instruction to copy 2D, which is what register C is pointing to, to register A. Okay? After that, we do a return. So the return is going to... <clears throat> so the, what the return did was um, it pops the return address, which is 1.5, into register, if I remember correctly, register B. So that means register D is now updated to point to you know, location FF. And then we perform the actual return, you know, the JMP B instruction in the callee. So by the time we got back to the caller, the stack pointer is still pointing to location uh, FF, which has 2D in it, which is our argument. But at that point, the function call is over. Why do I want to keep the argument on the stack when the function call is already over. So I have to deallocate, quote-unquote deallocate, the space used by the argument. So at that point, you know, I also update the stack pointer. So it now points back to location 00, zero which can be seen as the location after FF from the perspective of this discussion. So that is basically what's happening on the stack. So I'm really making a quick summary of all the modifications of register D and how we use register D to update the RAM you know, of the stack into a very you know, kind of simplistic picture like this one here. <clears throat> you can create your own picture. Okay? You know, once you know how to read the trays you know, in, the, in the Google Sheets, you can make your own picture. You can make an animated picture if you want to. So you know, I know many of you know how to make animated GIFs because you, have, you are a meme master. So, you know, Try to apply that skill to create animated GIFs to animate how the stack pointer and the stack you know, changes as we you know, run through this program. Are we good so far? Okay. <clears throat> so in terms of the text material, it is all you know, linked from um, Canvas already. So I just want to point out you know, what you need to read at this point. So we are currently, oh, 
Okay, so I did you know change you know the move all the uh, TTPSM tools and um, techniques to its own module. Okay, so I did clean up. I'm not sure why it didn't show up earlier. Maybe it, it showed up and I just did not read it correctly. Anyway, <clears throat> so this is what we just read earlier you know, with module uh, 0372. Um, this is another thing, you know, about of the same nature. Okay, so it's just a, oh, that's what we read earlier. Okay, so this one, is it the same thing? Yep, these two are indeed the same. Okay, so we just need to keep we just need to keep one of them. These two are actually the same. Today's lab is about stack operation, but it doesn't do anything about what to what we're introducing today. So I'm giving you guys some extra time to absorb the material in today's class. So today's the material that we talked about today is going to be in the lab on Thursday. Today's lab is about the material from last Thursday. So I'm basically staggering so that you have some time to study and absorb the material before the lab actually try to get you into doing something about that. All right. Are we doing okay so far? Do we have any questions? You know, because you know, if there are any questions, you know, bringing up the questions as soon as you have the questions is probably the best way to utilize an in-person class. I'm not seeing any hands or questions. I might want to resurrect, you know, like um, I used to have a spreadsheet where people can submit their questions so you know, they don't have to raise their hand. I can just read the question out of the spreadsheet. So I might have to resurrect that you know, because I, I'm thinking some people may not want to raise their hand because they just don't want to raise their hand. All right. <clears throat> All right. So from now on, you know, we go, we, we want to, Built upon you know what we have already talked about, we got about eh, twenty five minutes. So now I can make a stupid recursive you know function, and it doesn't do a single thing, but it does illustrate you know the concept of recursion. So we're gonna do that. So we, let me go back to the command line interface because this is just kind of the environment you know where I like to write my code. So we'll do a recursion here, okay? Rec and rec. So once again, the left-hand side is the C code, the right-hand side is the assembly code. And I will try to make the screen a little bit wider, so this way, if I have comments, I have more space. There we go. Okay. So this time, I'm going to you know, pound include stdint.h again. And this time, we'll have a subroutine that is recursive. And we'll just have a void function this time. Okay. So it doesn't even bother to return a value. So it's just a void function. Oh, do I want it to return something? Let's make it return something. U int eight underscore t. Um, R U C, you know, recursive, you know, function, and it takes one single parameter, which I will call n here. And what it's going to do, okay, is going to return depending on what n is. If n is zero then it's just going to return zero. If n is something other than zero, it will return the, re the return value of a recursive call of you know, recursive function n minus one plus whatever n is at this point, okay? So this is the um, C code, and then we need a main you know, to kind of you know, actually run this code. And it's going to call REC, the recursive function, with a particular parameter. Let's make it three. And then it has a return zero. So once again, you know, the return value is going to quote unquote la la land because we are, I'm not storing the return value on line 10 to a local variable or global variable, but I can find it in register A. Okay, so I can actually test run this code in GCC using GDB and find out, okay, so what is the value of REC3, okay, you're based on the code here. So now we go test this code. So let me push the to PMP, GCC dash G, which is including the debug information, dash O, which names the executable, 
which is RUC, and then RUC.C, which is the name of the source code. And <clears throat> I forgot to save the file. <laughs> you can see the plus here. It means I forgot to save. So I'm going to save it first. And then, oops, go back to the command line interface. Do this one more time. GDB RUC, list the program. And I'm going to put a breakpoint on line 5, okay, because I want to illustrate <clears throat> how you can use GDB to help you visualize what is going on when you have recursive functions. So we'll run the program. Oh, I need a breakpoint after line 10 as well, so that will be line 11. There we go. All right. So what GDB is now saying is I'm at a breakpoint on line 5. This is from the invocation of n being 3. Okay, which is the first call to RUC. If I continue execution, it's going to break again because RUC calls itself. So this is the second call to RUC when n as a, as a parameter has a value of 2. Continue, continue. This is the last one. So at this point, there are four invocations of RUC, quote unquote, on the stack. But when you look at this, you go like, I don't know what is going on, okay? So one really useful tool to help you understand the C code in this case is called backtrace. So backtrace shows you this is frame zero. Frame zero is always the most recent invocation of something, which is currently where we are at. So we are now at line five, and this is the fourth call to REC, where n equals to zero. The previous one is when n equals to 1, then the previous one is when n equals to 2, then the previous one is when n equals to 3, then the previous one is just main, because main is the entry point of the entire program. So this is, I think, a really great tool to help you visualize when you have a recursive call, what is happening? Well, we have one invocation of main, and then we have one invocation of REC, which then calls REC again, so now we have a second invocation, third invocation, and then we have a last, which is the fourth invocation of the same subroutine. You can sort of look at this as there are four instances of calling REC. They're all existing at the same time on the stack. Are we doing okay so far with this concept? Because you know, this helps you with some of your other classes as well. If you have not taken CISP three, uh, 430, which is data structure, they do talk about a lot of recursive you know, algorithms, this can help you debug recursive algorithms because it gives you the ability to stop and not only know that there's a problem with a particular line, but you can also backtrace and find out how you got there to begin with. So it gives you a lot of visibility of not only where you're at, but also how you got here from the callers or the caller of the caller or the caller of the caller of the caller. It gives you a lot of visibility. Okay, <clears throat> so one thing we can also do, okay, to illustrate the concept is um, where is n as a parameter? So we can say, okay, let's print where's n, okay, the address of n. So we just make note of this and say that, okay, it ends with EDC, you know, as hexadecimal. But this is referring to frame zero. So if I go back to an earlier frame, I can ask the same question. You can use frame one to basically say, I want to change my perspective to frame one. Okay, so I'm not in the perspective of frame zero, which is the most recent invocation. I'm looking now from the perspective of the previous invocation to what we are now at, and I can ask the same question. Where is n in this case? So this is really important because it shows that the, um, the address of n of the last invocation ends with EDC, the local, the parameter n of the previous invocation ends with the address of EFC. So from the perspective of relatively where they are on the stack, you can see how the latest invocation has a lower address, and then the previous invocation has a higher address. So that is also a pattern that is consistent with, guess what? <clears throat> what we are talking about here, the caller call the agreement ends up with that effect. In other words, these concepts are not applicable only to TTP ASM or only to this class. This really is how C code translates 
into assembly code. It does not matter which platform or which architecture you're targeting. They, the programming language itself makes use of these conventions. All right, so <clears throat> just a quick illustration there, you know, corresponding the C code to the addresses you know, of stuff on the stack. So now we try to write this code in assembly. <clears throat> so the typical thing, okay, you know, which is no op, JMT I to main to get around the definition of REC as a function. So here's REC. It always helpful. It is always helpful to take a look at you know, what is on the stack at this point and what is the stack pointer pointing to. Parameter n is at a higher location. Return address is you know, where the stack pointer is actually pointing to at the entry point of the subroutine. So in this case, I need to access n first, you know, because I need to make a decision. You know, should I just return a zero, or should I return this kind of big mess here? So we'll go ahead and figure out what to do with this. <clears throat> um, so I'm, I'm going to use the same approach as last time, which is a C P R C D. So now register C is pointing to the same location as register D, the stack pointer. I increment C again. So uh, so reg. Oops, I said one thing and wrote another thing. I increment C, so the C is now pointing to N. Then I retrieve the value of N, because right now C only has the address of N. I need to retrieve the value of N, so I need an LD instruction to do that. And then at this point, register A is parameter N, and I can now compare that. I don't really need to use a CMP, because all I want to know is, is it zero? Okay. Other than zero, it doesn't matter to me, because if it is zero, I just return a zero. If it is not zero, I got stuff to do. So I don't need to compare that to a specific value, which means setting up for CMP is okay. It will work, but we got a shortcut to test whether something is zero or not. What is that instruction? The value that I want to test in, is in register A. What is the quickest way to see whether it is a zero or not? That is coming from the lab from last Tuesday. Mm, that jumps after the flags are set. How do I set the flags? Yep, yep, and what am I ending in this case? And A with A itself, that is correct. So and AA is gonna force the value of A, register A, through the ALU, affecting the sign flag and the Z flag, and then storing the result back into register A. But if you're ending the same bit pattern with itself, it doesn't change the bit pattern because one and one is a one, zero and zero is a zero, so it just preserves the value of the register. If the whole exercise is to push, is okay, shouldn't use push because it has a speci specific meaning. So the whole idea is to get register A's value through the ALU to set, you know, to change the flags Z as well as S. In this case, the sign flag has no importance to me because I just want to know whether it's a zero or not. So we can now follow it you know, with a JCI. If it is zero, we go to one place. If it's not, we continue execution. So I'm just going to say, you know, go to the then portion. Okay, so then expression. So if we do end up here, this is the else expression. Okay, so that means, you know, the else expression is the big mess that I have to do over here. And I'm going to deal with that later, okay? Because I always want to do the simple stuff first. So I need to jump around, you know, to the end of the whole thing. So we'll say this is the end of REC. We'll jump around the following code, and then then EXPR as a label is going to say, oh, we just have to return zero. But guess what? That zero is already in register A at this point. I have nothing to do at this point. So I can just say REC END here. Yes, there's a way to optimize the code, but I'm just going to leave it like this, okay? And I'll just say, but register A already has zero, okay? So there's nothing I have to do here. All right, so the big mess is this chunk of code here. We have to call REC with N minus one and then add N to that whole thing, okay? So how am I going to do this? Well, we'll do one thing at a time, okay? The value of n is now in register A, so I was just gonna go ahead and call the subroutine first. So I have to decrement register A, which gets n minus one, 
<coughs> push it on the stack, which means you have decrement D, S, T, D, A. So that would push N minus 1 on the stack. Now I have to push the return address because I'm about to call REC again. So we just have to say this is the continuation point from REC. Uh, the recursive call of REC. Okay, so rec, rec. <coughs> So now we just do the usual thing, decrement D, LDI, you know, we can use register A at this point for this, because register A does not store anything that I have to preserve. So I call, I put the return address into register A, and then I store that to whatever, whatever the stack point is pointing to, and therefore pushing the return address. So what I've done at this point is I just push N minus 1 on the stack. I also pushed the return address on the stack. And after the you know, continuation point here, um, it means you know, this is right after REC returns. Now I have to add N to register A, which has the return value of the recursive call. So to do that, I can, uh, I can always redo everything that we did earlier, which is you know, copy register D to register C, increment register C, um, and then do an LD instruction to retrieve N into register B this time. So, um, okay, I said one thing, I did another. Okay, register C, not register D. So at this point, register B contains the address of N again, which means I just need a, uh, no, I take it back. This is actually, register B has the value of N at this point. So I'm just gonna comment here. Uh, register A has the return value of the recursive call. Register B now has the value of N itself. I just have to add these two, okay? So I'm just gonna say add AD, which adds B to A, which means register A now has the proper return value because you know, this, you know, this part, this expression is what I want to return. And now I can continue the execution at the end of the subroutine, which really has nothing else to do other than the return sequence of the instruction. So that's going to be LD. I can use any register except for register A because register A has the return value. So we just you know, say uh, load B with D, increment D, JMD back to B. And that's the subroutine. And then we have main. Main has to call uh, REC with three. So we just do a LDI register A with three, which is the value we want to push on the stack. Decrement D. STDA, that pushes three on the stack. And then we have another label here, which is the continuation point. Continue from REC in the main program or the main subroutine. So we have to load register A with that label. Continue from REC, decrement D, STDA. That pushes the return address. Then we continue the execution at the subroutine, which is REC. When it does come back, oh, I forgot one thing. Okay, somebody, you guys did not uh, remind me that tag, you forgot one thing. What did I forget earlier? Okay, so this is the continuation point. So I forgot one thing. What did I forget? What is still sitting on the stack right at the continuation point? Okay, so let's recall what happens when we call REC. We push the argument, we push the return address, we get to the subroutine. The subroutine makes use of the parameter and then it pops the return address. And then we get back to the caller. What is still sitting on the stack at this point? No, the return address is taken care of. The subroutine is responsible to deallocate the return address. There's one more item on the stack. What was that? Yep, the argument, okay? So the argument is still sitting on the stack and that means you know it needs to be taken care of. So that means I have to increment D to remove the argument on the stack, okay? That's what I forgot to do. So that means you know, over here, same thing. Increment D to remove the argument on the stack. And now you know, the stack is cleaned up. Register A has the return value from return uh, from the call to REC with a with a parameter with an argument of three. So now I can call the instruction here. 
All right, so let's test a few things, okay? Because you know, I do last time when I tested the C code, I forgot to do one thing. Um, I did not you know, test you know, what is EAX at this point because I need the assembly code to do the same thing. So I need to know what the C code is doing so I can check the assembly code. So I just have to say print EAX. It should be a six. There we go. Because what it's doing is adding zero, one, two, three into one single sum, and that's six. That's what it's doing. Okay, so now that we know what the C code is doing, we can now say, okay, let's test the assembly code and see whether it is doing the same thing or not. So we go back to the reverse spider folder, and then we submit the um, REC TTP ASM code. <clears throat> And this one is going to have a longer trace. Let me go to the trace again. Okay, so this time it's a lot longer, and it's taking time to refresh. So what I'm going to do is, I, I'm, you know, it depends. Okay, if you're doing this and you're not really conf confident that you got the code right, you probably don't want to do the same thing here. But I'm just going to skip all the way to the end and see what was the last update to register A. This was the last update to register A and it becomes three, four. So that means the code did not do what it is supposed to. And you can also see that, you know, it went to some, it continued execution at location two. So this is wrong. The program is not working. I got seven minutes to debug this program. So I think this is great, okay? You know, a lot of times I really hope the program doesn't work so I can actually show you how to debug a program based on what we have learned. Yes? Hmm? Say that one more time, sorry. We don't have to, you know, because you know, when, you, when the program started, reg all the registers start with a value of zero to begin with. So that one is kind of more of an annotation than anything else. You don't really have to load register D with a zero. So that is not the issue. Okay, so I do want to kind of debug this program. Uh, one sign that something is wrong is, you know, FE has, uh, I mean, register D, the stack pointer has a value of FE. So let's go back and trace it line by line, okay? Uh, sometimes there are no easy ways to debug a program other than following the trace instruction by instruction. So that's what we're gonna do now. <clears throat> Okay, no op, no big deal, JMP to main, no big deal. Push three on the stack, okay, this is the result of pushing the initial argument of three on the stack from main. And then we have the pushing of the continuation point. So let me check the assemble tab to see if that is the correct location. So this is indeed the correct location because two four is the place to continue execution. So, so far the analysis is correct. Then we get into the subroutine, okay? So this is the first thing we do in the function. We copy register D to register C. So register C is also FE. And then we increment register C, so it's now FF, which points to parameter N in the function. We copy whatever register, is, register C is pointing to to register A. So register A is now parameter N. <clears throat> We do an and AA, it should set the zero, uh, it should not set the zero flag because it is it's a three, not a zero. So that means we should do go to the continuation point of the else, the branch should not happen. So you can see that the branch actually did not happen because, um, oh, not yet. This is the conditional branch, but then the branch did not happen. That's why uh, location zero nine is the next instruction. At that point, we decrement A so that register A is N minus one, it is a two. We decrement D and then store um, whatever register A has into whatever, whatever the stack one is pointing to, therefore pushing the two, which is the N minus one on the stack. And then we decrement D and then push the uh, return address inside REC itself on the stack. So that should be location one zero we go to the assemble tab and then we see whether that is the correct place. 
So continue. So this is the correct place. Your location one zero is indeed the correct place. So now we continue our analysis. All right. So now we have the recursive call set up. Your know, two is the argument, and one zero is the return address. We get back into the subroutine. Um, oh, I forgot one thing. <laughs> okay. So right away, I can see something is wrong because at this point, I need to go to the subroutine. I just set up the stack with the argument and also the return address. The next thing that it should do is a JMPI to the subroutine, but I did not. So I have to go back to the source code here and look at the code right after I set up everything. And right between line 18 and 19, that should be a JMPI to REC. I forgot about that. So I set up everything, but I did not continue execution at the subroutine. So this is what I missed. It's a, it's a branch, unconditional branch to the subroutine itself. So at this point, you, know, you might see that, oh, so when we are making a call to a function, even if we're inside that very same function, the way we do the call is no different, okay? So that's one thing that you might want to kind of focus on you know, after today's class. I mean, this is a program that you probably have to spend some time to kind of revisit and also to review and with your own notes. I did not put a whole lot of comments into this program for that reason, because I want you to add your own annotation and comments to this program. So that means you know, I'm gonna send this program to all of you through an announcement. You, you're gonna have the source code. All right, so now we can test the program again, okay? And this is why I like, you know, River Spider, because, you know, I just have to do one line. Repeat the previous line, and it will take care of the running for me. It's still not fast, but gets the job done, okay? Let me switch back to the analysis tab. All right. So this is refreshed already, so we, we can see how it, it is actually doing the branch this time. And you know, since I'm usually overconfident, I can page all the way down and look at the last time register A got changed before the halt instruction. And we can see how register A is updated to six, which is the correct result. This is the return value from the first invocation of REC. We can also see how register D is going back to zero, zero, which is good because you know, now we know the stack is balanced. And we also know that the last instruction to execute is at, at location two seven, and it's the halt instruction. So as far as I'm concerned, the program is now correct. And we are right on time. We got a few seconds left, 15 to be exact. <laughs> All right. So today's lecture is heavy duty, okay? There's no question about you know, how we are building up additional concepts based on what we have already talked about. So today's lecture is heavy, okay? We have a lot of concepts introduced, techniques also introduced, and so on, which means you really have to spend the time to you know, kind of review the, all the stuff that we have talked about today. Um, I'm sure I have mentioned this already, you know, in, at, on the first day of class, for every hour in a lecture, you're supposed to spend two additional hours, you know, on your own, that's not counting the lab time, to review the material. So I think, you know, with this material, it's going to use up, you know, those 160 minutes, because the lecture itself is 80 minutes, which means you're supposed to spend 160 minutes outside of the lecture and the lab to review the material before Thursday, <laughs> okay? It sounds like a lot, okay? You know, but that's what it's gonna take to you know, kind of finish up this semester, get a good grade, and so you can move on. All right, so that's that. You know, this is you know, the content of today's lecture. So now I would show you the lab. Uh, the lab is called Stack Operations, so I will make it visible. But instead of you know, just letting you guys go right now you know, to kind of deal with the test, I do want to ask for your opinion. Because you know, I am tempted 
to change the allowed attempts to a fixed number instead of unlimited. So what, what do you think? I will still keep the highest score in case instead of the average, which is one of the options. So I will still keep the highest score, but I, so my thinking is I have seen some people um, basically doing the infinite monkey approach. So they would just test every single option for every single question, then they get the answer, and then they just move on. They, they say, I'm done with this lab. But using that approach is bypassing the value of the lab because I include a lot of instructions in the lab. So if I turn this off, it means you know, the infinite monkey approach would still work, which I think is not uh, beneficial to people who you know, basically use that approach. If, but if I turn it on and give you like you know, 10 attempts or something like that, some people may have this psychological effect. It's like, oh, what if I cannot, done, cannot get it done in 10 trials, even if I'm reading everything and trying my best? So it's kind of like a trade-off like that. So I'm going to turn it off you know, at this point. But if you have any opinion about you know, whether to allow an infinite number of attempts within the time allowed, um, you can send me an email. Okay? So you don't have to raise your hand and talk about this in front of your peers. You can just go ahead and send me an email to tell me what you think about that. Or you can also tell me you know, if I were to turn off this feature and just give you a fixed number of attempts, what you think about you know, that particular option. So I'm kind of open to your opinions um, because I really hate to say it this way because it sounds really bad, but it really is the truth is it's not my grade. <laughs> Ultimately, it is not my grade and it is not me who is transferring to a four-year university. So you just have to tell me you know, what you think from your perspective. And you know, it, either way, it's OK. It's just a lab activity. I mean, anyway, the um, access code is LIFO, which stands for last in, first out. So I'm going to write it on the whiteboard. <coughs> L-I-F-O, all lowercase. And I believe you can start it now, because I think I published it already. Okay, so now you have an infinite number of your know, attempts. Yes. Sorry? I cannot hear you, sorry. We're not doing attendance. We are not doing attendance today, that is correct. All right. So you should be able to access it because it is already published. And once again, the access code is LIFO, L I F O. And I am going to upload the video right away, just in case you know, some of you want to kind of revisit the video itself. Alrighty, so let me turn off the recorder, then upload.